Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. And thank you for your patience. Um, it uh, is my pleasure to welcome you very warmly here to this high level panel on combating corruption to protect the environment. I'm starting with a couple of housekeeping uh, announcements. Uh, this session is a hybrid session and is taking place also via Zoom. Thanks to um, the funding from uh, GIZ and USAID and also my own little organization, we also have interpretation into English and French, uh, English, French and Spanish, I should say. If you wish to access interpretation when you're here in the room, you'd have to log into the Zoom meeting on your mobile phone uh, or laptop and listen to the interpretation on Zoom. And it would be very kind if you could use headphones. I don't know how practical that is for the people in the room, but at least those online will have the French and the Spanish um, version. And for those online participants, it's wonderful to have you here as well, or virtually here. Be so kind and mute your microphone so that we don't bother each other with too much background noise. After that, um, once again, it's, it's an honor to chair this high-level segment. And I'd really like uh, to congratulate and thank the organizers for uh, the decision to dedicate a sustainable, substantial program today and also on Wednesday uh, to this incredibly important topic. Corruption and the environment, in my humble opinion, are among the greatest challenges our societies face. Both are deeply connected and both are intrinsically connected with the goals we have set ourselves for sustainable development, equitable development and a world of peace and prosperity. And most dramatically, I think the interconnection of these topics is visible when we see how corruption and environmental degradation lead to insecurity, instability and conflict. So looking at them together is extremely important. I'm very, very grateful we have this wonderful panel here today to discuss and kickstart a conversation, which I am sure will go through the entire week. It's uh, also a particular pleasure to have a panel with a very diverse set of leaders representing different kinds of countries, different kinds of organizations, because this kind of multi-stakeholder commitment at the highest level is exactly what we need. So. With that being said, and without further ado, I'd very much like to turn to my distinguished panelists, and perhaps if I can turn to the United States first, Maggie Nardi on my very far left. She's Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary at the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs at the US Department of State. Maggie, maybe if I can bring you in on a topic that I call the convergence topic, there are many closely related fields of environmental conservation, and it would be really great if we could hear from you about some of them to start with the bigger, bigger picture or the wider picture. So how do you see the efforts of or the effects of corruption on the environment and on the resources that contribute to efforts uh, to conserve biodiversity, address nature crime, and facilitate clean energy and clean transition. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, Greta, for that question. And I'd like to thank UNODC Executive Director Wally and UNODC for organizing this special session on the environment. I think this high-level dialogue is a good way to kick off that discussion. And I'm, I can't tell you how impressed I am looking around the room Every seat is filled and standing room only, which tells you something about the importance of this issue. And I would say probably growing recognition of this issue and the role of corruption uh, in facilitating it. So I, I thanks, thanks again to our hosts for organizing this. Um, I think as has been said already, Corruption uh, fuels and facilitates all sorts of transnational organized crime, and crimes against nature are no different at all. These crimes harm ecosystems. They deprive local economies of, of a way of life. They can uh, reduce developmental opportunities, and they can degrade the efforts to conserve. All of these take a long-term toll, but also short-term on the communities where they are. So just to be clear on terminology, when I'm speaking about nature crimes, what I'm thinking of are the group of crimes related to um, illegal logging, to mining, to trafficking in wildlife, 
uh, to land movement and its associated um, crimes, and also to illegal fishing, which is not necessarily something everyone thinks of, but all of those together comprise uh, what we would consider nature crimes. And each and every one of them can have a devastating impact on a local economy and also on the broader transnational uh, economy as well. So no country, uh, no government for sure, can succeed alone in fighting these crimes because they are transnational in nature and they aren't always visible to everyone. Uh, and that's why the U United States is starting to do more in this area. I will say certainly my bureau is doing uh, more on environmental crimes in general, trafficking in wildlife, uh, fishing and mining in particular, as well as timber. Um, but earlier this year, my government partnered with the government of Norway and the World Resource Institute uh, to launch the Nature Crime Alliance. And by doing this, we're hoping this multi-sectoral approach uh, will provide a platform to elevate the, the importance of these crimes, as well as to identify additional resources and to uh, encourage more participation in trying to combat this crime. And so we look forward, it's a very new initiative, uh, but we look forward to see how we might be able to contribute to uh, solving this issue. We use a whole range of tools uh, in addition to this, to try to combat this scourge. Uh, we have visa restrictions, visa revocation, and you may have just heard this morning, uh, Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield was saying that uh, the president just gave Secretary of State Blinken uh, a new authority to revoke the visas of corruption enablers. Um, up until now, we have only been able to go after uh, current or previous uh, corrupt officials, but now we are widening the scope um, so that we can try to capture sort of the full net of those who are engaged in these crimes. Um, and we, not that long ago, revoked the visas of a number of officials in Africa who were engaged in uh, the illegal trafficking of primates uh, to another part of the world. We also have a, a transnational organized crime reward program, and uh, we are heightening our use of this to go after those who engage in environmental crimes. Um, we have seen that um, the same networks, the same routes, often the same individuals are involved, not just in crimes against nature, but also um, drug trafficking, human trafficking, weapons trafficking. It's the same routes, it's just another commodity. Uh, and in fact, we are targeting uh, a number of individuals who had been in the government who had been trafficking in rhino horn and elephant tusks and also heroin. So. Same network, uh, different markets, uh, different individual purchasers, but the same networks. And so um, it's really insidious. So you can't just say, well, it's just one type of crime. It's a nature crime. It's really not that important. Everything is connected. Um, and so I think we all really need to work together in order to uh, try to fight this scourge. Um, talking, Turning to energy for, for just a moment, I think, we're also seeing corruption uh, linked to uh, conventional energy and also in, to mining sectors. And there, that is an area that's rife for embezzlement uh, and also rent seeking and other corrupt behaviors. Um, and we think the move to clean energy, where we'll be using other minerals, is going to uh, be more problematic because that will rely even more on the mining of these limited resources. So we are trying to take different steps to address that. And in June of last year, we uh, joined 11 other countries in establishing the Mineral Security Partnership. The idea is to diversify uh, responsible mineral supply chains while maintaining high environmental, social, and government standards in mining, production, and processing. So we started with the 12 countries. We're now up to 14 countries, uh, which comprise about 50% of global GDP. So we are looking to continue to grow that group um, as well. Outside of the State Department, uh, the US Agency for International Development also does uh, work in this area. And many of you probably know that. They have uh, done some efforts in uh, the, in energy and the environment through the targeting natural resource corruption 
Center through support to extractive industries transparency initiative that's quite a name and empowering a just energy transition green minerals challenge, uh, which I think is something that's going to be discussed in more detail later. So we are trying to do more in this area, and we are very focused on connecting the dots between those that traffic in different, whether it's drugs or weapons uh, and natural resources, uh, to try to go after the networks as a whole. But we can only do that together. So I'll end there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maggie. And I think you've, you've set the stage perfectly, uh, you know, pulling together the very many sectors in the environmental space that we need to look at and also I think pointing to the need for multi-stakeholder engagement and I know we'll speak uh, more about this later on. Uh, just now I'm very very pleased and privileged to that we have been joined by the president of Kiribati, uh, His Excellency Mr. Taneti Mamao. Uh, if I can turn to you Mr. President immediately and ask uh, about the experience of Kiribati and we do know that your country uh, is suffering most profoundly from the impact of environmental degradation and climate change. And, and it would be uh, very interesting and enlightening for us to hear how you experience also the connection between corruption and environmental um, degradation. What sectors do you see also particularly affected and, and what can Kiribati do and what needs to be done to, 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 to help in this task? Mr. President, please, thank you. Well, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair, distinct Excellencies, distinguished speakers, and delegates, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I bring to you my government and the people of Kiribati's warm greetings. In his holy name, I greet you all. Kamnapanini Maori. Today's topic on corruption and environment provides an excellent opportunity to share experiences on the detrimental impact of corruption and addressing climate change and fisheries issues. In Kiribati, our expensive exclusive economic zone hosts incredible and rich biodiversity and abundant natural resources. However, it faces significant corruption risk that threaten sustainable development and worsen the impacts of climate change. The fisheries value chain is particularly vulnerable with potential consequences, including illegal fishing, overfishing, habitat destruction, and mislabeling of fish. Recognizing the gravity of the situation, Kiribati has embraced the corruption risk assessment tool in collaboration with UNODC experts. This proactive strategy aims to systematically analyze corruption vulnerabilities within the EEZ management. The corruption, critical, the corruption risk assessment tool facilitates the identification of key areas susceptible to corruption, such as licensing, processing, monitoring, enforcement activities, and revenue correction. By understanding this risk, Kiribati and other, na other nations can develop targeted anti-corruption measures tailored to the specific needs of EEZ governance. Chairman, in addressing the critical nexus between corruption and climate change, particularly in the context of Kiribati's vulnerability as a small island developing state, it is imperative to recognize their intertwined challenges Corruption intensifies the adverse effect of climate change, impeding environment, environmental governance and diverting essential resources from sustainable initiatives. Illicit activities such as illegal resources exploitation and fraudulent fund allocation exacerbate impacts of rising sea levels, extreme weather events and disruptions to livelihoods. To combat this dual threat, comprehensive efforts are needed, encompassing strengthened governance structures, transparency promotion, and sustainable practices. Kiribati's current three-year national anti-corruption strategy aims to fortify governance and anti-corruption frameworks, fostering re resilience 
against climate change impact. In the face of these interconnected challenges, Kiribati's calls for strengthened international cooperation and a unified commitment to tackle corruption in the EEZ and address climate change comprehensively. Let us work together to combat corruption in our EEZ and address the challenges posed by climate change, ensuring a sustainable and equitable future for our planet. I thank you. Thank you very, very much, Mr. President. Um, I think it's, it's particularly impressive listening to you uh, about the exposure of small jurisdictions and at the same time hearing that even if you're a small state, that really doesn't mean you're a powerless state, of course. And in fact, it was very interesting to hear the many opportunities that your country has identified in terms of what can be done on Kiribati itself, but also how you can work with others. And in a way, Mr. President, you've gave me the perfect transition to our next uh, panelist, who, uh, if I may say so, also represents a relatively small country, uh, Her Excellency uh, Dominique Hasler, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Education and Sports of the Principality of Liechtenstein. I couldn't tell you which of the two countries is smaller, but I think they, they are both uh, known as being small and powerful and, and inventive and innovative when it comes to finding solutions. So, uh, Dominique, if I can turn to you, um, and perhaps you could start by just telling us how a country like Liechtenstein, we know Liechtenstein as, a, as an important financial center as well, can engage both as a country itself, but also in the global effort uh, to uh, counteract the, the terrible effect of corruption on environmental degradation. Thank you, Madam Minister, please. So thank you very much, Madam Moderator, and thank you also uh, to UNODC, the United States, and my fellow participants for giving this topic this important visibility it deserves here in Atlanta. This event is extremely relevant. Four years ago in Abu Dhabi, we have committed ourselves uh, to join forces against uh, the criminals who deliberately destroy our planet and undermine the rule of law in doing so. Those criminals and their networks grow stronger every day. And I think this is important that we, we as a community have to grow stronger too. And I think this is also why I also appreciate uh, that we have so much uh, participants today. And I think also, as uh, Madam Moderator mentioned before, it needs everybody, be it small or big. Your question points a very fundamental issue. Uh, the question about why is this a global and a whole of uh, society effort? The answer, in my view, is this. What we are facing are crimes that are transnational and transcend the formal and informal sectors. Around the world and in Liechtenstein too, people become more and more aware how interconnected we are and we are all part of global supply chains. Financial flows, licit and illicit, are also global. This comes with responsibilities and actually opportunities for everybody to be part of the solution. And for us in Liechtenstein, it means we have to implement international standards and enhance our international cooperation and partnerships. First, we keep a strong focus on ensuring that our domestic laws deter crime from our financial center. We have also established an anonymous whistleblower system and a register of beneficial ownership. <clears throat> Second, <clears throat> we continue to see great benefits in learning from each other's good practices in implementing and improving our standards in the relevant multilateral for us. At the same time, we are also deepening our network of bilateral cooperation. And third, we value our partnerships to interrupt criminal networks. A good example is our work with the Basel Institute on Governance. Together with USAID, we are supporting a forum for practitioners on environmental corruption from government, civil society, the private sector, the media and academia. This forum brings hundreds of corruptions fighters from all dimensions of society together. 
it is precisely the kind of uh, multi-stakeholder engagement we should be looking for. One key area where Liechtenstein can make a difference is in promoting the follow the money approach. We have found the financial investigations are effective in uncovering larger criminal networks and stop the flows of illicit money derived from crime. In this way, we can raise the price for crimes against our planet. Involving all stakeholders is crucial for us to succeed. And to me, it is the true meaning of the global partnership, so-called global partnership, that SDG 17 has defined. To address this global challenge, we need all hands on deck. This high-level uh, event is a good start, and we should continue to strengthen formats where civil society and the private sector can fully and meaningfully participate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Minister. I think you raised some, some additional really relevant topics. I think you pointed to the role of asset tracing, which I, I cannot agree more is a really important uh, tool against uh, corruption in all sectors, but also in the environment. It serves both as a deterrent, but also, of course, uh, to make those who, who destroy our uh, environment through corruption and other forms of financial crime pay for it. The other point I think you made, which I found particularly important, is that you pointed to the informal and the formal issues. And I think that is one message, certainly, that I, that I hear loud and clear. It's important, of course, to work with formal institutions through formal mechanisms, but we have to understand that especially criminal networks they don't necessarily follow the formal structure, so we need to understand how the informality of crime also affects us. And, and with that, I think we also moved immediately a little bit into the international sphere, and, and I'm very, very pleased and delighted to turn to a person on this panel that certainly needs no introductions at this conference, but um, protocol, of course, observed. I will have the great pleasure of introducing Her Excellency Madame Gadawali, the Executive uh, Director of UN ODC, as I said, uh, no need for introductions really required. It's delightful and wonderful that you are able to join this panel. I think it shows you an ODC's great commitment to this to this topic. So I think if, if you can just talk to us a little bit about how from an international organization, the powerful crime fighter international uh, organization that you represent, what can the international community do more? What should we do more? Where are we already doing well and where can we reinforce those efforts? Thank you very much, Madam. Thank you very much. And uh, let me start by saying good afternoon, everyone. And it's very inspiring to see a room full of participants with such a broad representation. And this in and of itself is a reason for optimism. And coming from Dubai, where I was there uh, attending COP28, uh, and we have seen uh, commitments already go into the loss and damage fund, which was launched last year in COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh. We see this year uh, UAE, we see uh, Germany and other countries pledging resources to the loss and damage fund. But I also saw a lot of UN entities and agencies each contributing uh, uh, in a very meaningful way to this debate. And this, again, is testament to a bigger realization of the importance and the urgency of the topic of, of climate. So let me start by saying how honored I am to join Mr. President, Madam Ministers, and the esteemed colleagues uh, on this distinguished panel. And also, I would like to specifically thank the Basel Institute on Governance and Liechtenstein for this important report. This, this is a very important report. And looking at the report, I was very pleased to see that it's mentioning the crimes against the environment that UNODC has been focusing on, starting from deforestation to uh, illegal mining, wildlife trafficking, waste trafficking, crimes in the fisheries sector, crimes in the forestry sector, air, water, soil pollutions, and um, illegal trade of ozone. So this, this last uh, uh, crime, is the only one that we're not addressing. But other than this, the whole list is part of our program. So um, beyond uh, excited, actually, I think that this is an important uh, gathering here. And um, what we need to spend is at least 3.4 billion a year by 2030 to prevent a wide-scale climate catastrophe. 
we all know that this money is not available. Uh, what is made available is just a fraction. Uh, so that's why addressing crimes against the environment is very important. And that's why also addressing corruption is extremely important. Corruption in and of itself, because it's depleting the world from the many resources needed for this and for other topics, but also because in many of these crimes mentioned in this report is corruption that facilitates such crimes to take place. So we cannot lose to uh, we cannot lose any resources to corruption, and we must ensure that funds reach their intended targets, and the dangers extend beyond the lost funds. Corruption damages the public trust in governments, weakens rule of law, and widens the gap between high and low income countries. Now, if the question is how can the international community strengthen controls, I have very specific um, uh, suggestions here. Firstly, governments must integrate anti-corruption measures. In, into all national and international climate strategies. So whenever there is a strategy, be it national or regional, you need to integrate uh, anti-corruption measures in such strategies and be very aware of the dangers of corruption and alert law enforcement officers build, build their capacities, alert the judiciary and all uh, um, parties in a whole of society approach. This would include improving transparency and accountability, creating legislation to reduce loopholes, initiating programs to increase citizen participation, and of course, private sector leadership in national climate goals. A large portion of climate finance is invested in green energy markets, where we have already seen evidence of transnational corruption and where governance and regulatory frameworks are missing. So whenever there's a new trend, a new area of work, such as green energy markets, uh, the, the market is ahead of the regulators, so we really need to um, look at the regulation and look at governance structures. Governments must also raise the awareness of law enforcement, and, and I mentioned judiciary and practitioners, because uh, many crimes are facilitated, as I said, by corruption. Second, business needs clear rules and regulations that are consistent across jurisdictions and shared standards of emissions. Uh, targets and renewable energy goals. A level playing field helps prevent corruption. In the rush of to transition to renewables, businesses are taking advantage of some countries where less regulation, less regulated environment are there and to save on operating costs and to avoid the penalties. So we have to be very aware of these uh, uh, gaps in legislation in different parts of the world and the widening gap between countries that already are, uh, are regulating uh, this uh, and, and others that are not yet there. We also see the lack of, of consistent regulation in carbon trading markets, leaving these mechanisms vulnerable to corruption and misuse. And this is especially concerning as the global carbon credit market is growing exponentially. It is valued at um, two, billion in 2022 and projected to reach 143 billion by 2032. So in 10 years, this exponential growth will create opportunities for uh, corrupt practices. Wherever you see a lot of money, you will see corrupt practices. Third, we need to keep up the pressure and keep the issue of anti-corruption on the climate agenda. This is what uh, the different UN entities that I have uh, joined hands with last week in Dubai were trying to do. This is what such reports like the Basel Institute on Governance is trying to do. So keeping uh, and increasing uh, um, the issue, keeping the issue of anti-corruption on the climate agenda is very crucial. Uh, next year's climate change conference will take place in Azerbaijan. This was decided yesterday at COP28, uh, and uh, we will need to cover and address the dangers that corruption poses to our global climate agenda. So we need to start preparing and planning today for next year's COP to make sure that corruption is uh, on the agenda. UNODC is also working with the World Bank to highlight corruption risks linked to climate change. Together with the bank, we have produced an initial paper providing suggestions on how to address these risks. As the climate crisis accelerates, so must our responses. UNODC will continue supporting governments to, to put recommendations into action, promoting clean responses for clean energy and strengthening integrity and justice at all levels, the national level, the regional level, and the global policy level. So thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Ms. Wally, for these really inspiring words and, and the very, very concrete recommendations that I'm sure we're going to pick up many of them. I hope we should over the next uh, few days. And also many thanks for the, for the kind report. And most importantly, I think the reference to the really very substantial program that UNODC is implementing with, with partner countries 
uh, in, in this, you know, many sectors. And it was actually interesting to just hear you read out all the sectors, which goes to show the, you know, the vastness of the challenge that we have at stake. And in this regard, I'd also like to highlight another point you made in terms of integrating anti-corruption in anything to do with climate change or environmental you know policies because we really need to bring these communities together and i think some of the communities that were mentioned by earlier speakers in this regard make a great contribution i hear from you also cop next year that's our goal let's collectively make sure we have the topic high on the agenda at the cop next year Turning now, if I may, uh, to UNDP, because of course, in terms of implementing the many recommendations that uh, the executive director of UNODC has just given us our task list, I think UNDP is and will be an important partner uh, to many countries. So uh, we have the pleasure of having Francine Pickup with us. She's the deputy assistant administrator and deputy director in the Bureau for Policy and Program Support at UNDP. I know that you've also got lots of country level experience, so maybe you can you can help us bridge that gap and and talk to us a little bit about uh, maybe UNDP's experience and maybe even examples of where anti-corruption measures have really uh, helped countries reach their uh, climate goals, including in, in conservation and biodiversity. Thank you, Francis, for being here. Thank you so much. And it's really an honor to be part of this uh, panel on uh, the importance of, of, of fighting corruption in the protection of the environment. And as was said before me, it's a particularly timely moment given the ongoing COP28 uh, in Dubai. And so from illegal logging right through to wildlife tra trafficking through to the um, bribery in, in environmental per permits, carbon markets, as, as was mentioned, uh, through to lax enforcement of uh, regulations, corruption does continue to inflict severe damage on our very fragile ecosystems. Uh, deforestation has already been mentioned, but close to 420 million hectares of forest are, have been lost in the last 30 years from 1990 to 2020 as a result of deforestation, with corruption recognized as a, as a really big enabler of illegal exploitation of forest resources. And then the energy transition was already mentioned also, but with this increasing demand that we see for critical minerals, uh, it presents really substantial corruption risks, threatening our environment, raising the risk of conflict, and diverting much needed financing from the SDGs. In fact, if you look, 70% of people living in extreme poverty around the world live in these mineral rich countries. So poverty is actually a direct consequence of poorly governed mineral extraction. So at UNDP, we're helping uh, countries get the institutions right in energy transitions, including integrating environment and human rights, into governance of the mining sector. We actually just came out with a paper recently on uh, energy governance, including in the, in the mining sector. So getting the institutions right involves developing the capacity of public institutions, such as environment ministries, tax offices, anti-corruption agencies, as well as supporting civil society organizations to have the voice and representation when mining decisions are being made. For example, in Comoros, UNDP is supporting the development of the minerals resource, mobilization, uh, resource management policy, a mining code, and the regulatory framework there. Also, UNDP is helping mobilize 1 trillion in public and private capital for the SDGs. Now, an important part of that mobilization of finance for the SDGs must involve the climate um, and addressing climate change. So current discussions at the COP, uh, at COP28, 28 are very much focused on the issues of finance. And as was mentioned before me, we've seen major new commitments with the Loss and Damages Fund, as well as with the Global Climate Fund and other vertical funds. Resources directed to issues like energy, agriculture, and inclusion. So it's really important to ensure that these financial resources from all different sources of channels uh, 
are used where they're needed most, that we see accountable, inclusive and effective governance mechanisms from parliaments and other institutions with the appropriate oversight through to judicial systems which maintain rule of law to open civic space which supports the critical work of journalists and activists. Anti-corruption tools, including those powered by digital advancements, can also have the potential to help countries reach their climate, nature and biodiversity goals. So for example, in countries like Sri Lanka or Uganda, we've been working to help use data and digital monitoring tools to tackle illegal environmental practices and promote integrity and transparency in environment and resource management. So we can tackle corruption and successfully protect our environment, but we've got to act now and we have to act together. So I want to just finish by showing you a, a quick one minute video, if that's okay, just to summarize some of the key messages for us. I hope it works. Thank you, thank you so much, Francine, and also for, for bringing uh, this short video. I always find it a mix of particularly appeasing because you see the beauty of nature and the beauty of animals. And my favorite animal, the rhino, and then you know the hippo looking at the water. It makes you happy, and then you you're crushed in your hope by these dreadful, dreadful images. So, you know, sometimes images uh, say so much more than words. And this is not to say that the words we heard on this panel weren't incredibly important, of course. But thank you so much, Francine, for bringing this. I think I want to kind of have half come full circle again and um, turn now uh, to Her Excellency uh, Yvonne Dausap, who's the Minister of Justice uh, from Namibia, because I think we heard from the President of Kiribati about how a country can be so immediately affected by corruption and how it uh, contributes to environmental uh, degradation. And, and uh, let me let me say Namibia has had its share of challenges in this regard. Uh, quite a few people here at the conference will have heard of the so-called fish rot uh, scandal. And we obviously don't want to belabor that scandal in particular, but it would be very, very interesting to hear from you if we may, uh, Madam Minister, maybe some of the challenges you experienced in, in identifying the case and dealing with it, but also more interestingly forward-looking, what measures or what can we learn from it and what can we collectively take forward in terms of how to better deal with these issues? If, thank you, Madam Minister. Thank you very much and, and good afternoon, everyone. And all protocol observed. Such, such an important conversation, at least from a Namibian perspective. And, and, and I'm very proud uh, from a whole government perspective and, and just you know from a societal perspective that in the room we have very important key uh, independent functionaries. And I want to mention them. We have a member of the civil society who has very strong views, but also has done excellent work um, on, on fishing uh, crimes in Namibia specifically. Uh, Mr. Hopwood would also be speaking on Wednesday uh, at the technical meeting where uh, I will also be in the room like he is now. I'm sure he's taking notes so that he can rebut some of the things that I'll be saying from a government perspective, which is 
what we allow. Um, the, the other important thing is the fact that we have uh, the independent prosecution team in the room that are part of prosecuting, not specifically um, the, the fishing fish rod case, but, but are part of the team of prosecution. And this is important because prosecution in Namibia is constitutional, it's independent, and it makes those decisions on its own. I mention this because often as a government, as the executive, we are accused um, unfairly, I think, in my view, uh, of interference uh, and, and or participating. And, and I'm mentioning these functionaries because they play an important role. And then I'm not sure whether they're in the room, but we also have the Anti-Corruption Commission, who's part of this conference, uh, participating. And then uh, finally, we have the Financial Intelligence Center, who are our ears and uh, eyes on the ground to when they see that there's any illicit flows uh, of, of money into um, the bank accounts of, of many of us, um, uh, they would be the ones that would look at. And, and this just shows the kind of uh, robust system of engagement that we have as a country. So that's, I think for me, that's the first important part. The, the second thing about this, this important conversation is that Namibia is endowed with natural resources. And, and because of that, we are also quite attractive uh, for all sorts of uh, institutions and, and individuals. But we are constitutionally enjoined to protect our ecosystem. And, and that helps because you have a constitutional imperative that requires of you, and in a minute, uh, I, I want to read the text uh, of how strong the language in the constitution is when it comes to protecting um, our key natural resources, whether it's land, water, you know, forestry, fisheries, marine uh, biodiversity. But uh, one of the biggest debates that's happening in Namibia at the moment is what we call our new emerging energies. Uh, you know, the, the, the newly discovered oil, our green industries, and, and of course the conversation has been, is it a, is it a blessing? Uh, is, it, is it a curse? Is it going to be a panacea for uh, all of the problems that we have in the country? And, 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 and this collective responsibility that we're talking about to, is to protect our environment for the benefit of our present and, and future generations. Um, you know, our environmental justice ability as a country um, really relates to issues of food security. You can imagine uh, it's about social upliftment for us. It's about mitigating against the high levels of unemployment in the country and also against very high levels of inequality. So, so how do we do it? I think we're getting some things right. And, and one of the biggest lessons for us uh, maybe in three forms. The first one is our president leads from the front. Um, and you, you'd have imagined if, if you were at COP28, you'd also have seen that he was uh, sitting for no long hours talking about the issues that pertains to our emerging industries, but also uh, around environmental justice. Uh, but, and then the second thing, and just recently, actually, two days ago, he was calling on all of us to as a collective respond to ensuring that we eradicate uh, corruption from Namibia. So the political will um, is there, you know, and, and, and then the second, I think, is, is our policy, legal and institutional arrangements that we have in place, because that's important. You know, um, the president always tells us about a story of someone he spoke to and, and this particular individual said that corruption is everywhere. And, and the question really is, you know, what you do with it is, is what's going to determine how you're going to respond to, to corruption. So, so what did we learn from, from the fish rod case? I think the first for us is, is the fact that we have we have confidence in, in our judicial system. From what we've seen up to this point, I think uh, we, we believe in the integrity and in the independence and the impartiality of the judiciary. We, we believe that they can do a good work. Um, the, the lessons though, is that because people have committed a, a crime, doesn't take away adherence to basic tenets of, of the rule of law, about due process of law, about the, the number of rights, fair trial rights that needs to be complied with, whether it's your presumption of innocence, whether it is a speedy trial, whether it is the right against self-incrimination and so forth. So we, we realize that 
just because some an allegation is made and and something has gone wrong doesn't mean that we forget about those value propositions that we have in 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 the text of our constitution so upon discovery of of the alleged corruption all law enforcement agencies in namibia worked together to conduct the investigation and to collect the evidence necessary to take this matter to court and and one of the things um, th that we've learned when it comes to administration of justice in respect of this particular case is the fact that you must act fast and you must make sure that your administration of justice systems are oiled properly something that we think other countries need to learn uh, from namibia is that you know because there are other countries involved in in this particular alleged crime and 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 i think they must bring their perpetrators to book, something that we've not seen help happens in other uh, jurisdictions uh, as quickly as it should. Uh, you know, and that obviously has an impact on, on, on our case in Namibia. But the, the, this was done, and, and we must also recognize as a country, you know, relatively small with huge resource limitations, both human resource and other resources, in the record time, there were a number of things that, that we did. Um, and, and that is, we needed to investigate a case of this magnitude, um, and it had to do with the efficiency of our teams, the streamlined approach, and the excellent international cooperation throughout the investigation, and also the asset confiscation and preservation stages uh, of this case is a sterling example um, to the rest of the international community as to how such cases should be dealt with. Namibia prides itself um, in, in the strong language in our, in our constitution, which provides for the sovereign ownership of natural resources below and above the surface um, of, of the land and in the continental shelf and within the territorial waters uh, and its exclusive economic zone and states that these shall belong to the state if they are not otherwise lawfully owned. Our constitution further provides for the promotion of the welfare of the people and states in Article 95 that we, and I want to quote, um, uh, that we maintain ecosystems, essential ecological processes and biological diversity of Namibia and ensure realization of living natural resources on a sustainable basis for the benefit of all Namibians, both present and future. In particular, the government shall provide measures against the dumping or recycling of foreign nuclear and toxic waste on Namibian territory." End of quote. Namibia has a robust legal and institutional framework in place to combat corruption and environmental crimes. We have a task force consisting of various institutions and law enforcement agencies, among them the Anti-Corruption Commission, Financial Intelligence Center, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Environment and Tourism, Ministry of Fisheries and Marine Resources, the Namibia Revenue Agency, Office of the Judiciary, Office of the Inspe Inspector General of Police, the Office of the Prosecutor General and the Attorney General. These are institutional arrangements and mechanisms in place to combat corruption. These include systemic investigations, prosecution, and adjudication, as well as prevention mechanisms through increased awareness raising and education in, in initiatives. There's been a heightened sense of consciousness on the part of Namibians uh, since uh, since this particular incident happened. And, and it really has created uh, almost hog eyes on, on those in positions of power. Um, you know, you can't even uh, travel anywhere without people questioning why you're going to, to that event and what is the value uh, for the Namibian nation. So in this regard, the following interventions were operationalized. We established a specialized environmental crime unit within the Office of the Prosecutor General. Uh, there's a multi-sectoral training and capacity building of investigators, prosecutors, magistrates, and judges. We have lodging of rapid reference guide on the investigation and prosecution of environmental crimes. We have created a specialized temporary court in identified regions, which led to establishment of a permanent environmental crimes court. And uh, recently, there's been a signing of inter-agency memorandum of understanding on the investigation and prosecution of environmental crimes, corruption, money laundering, and asset recovery. As I conclude, it's also noteworthy 
that we have recently operationalized our witness protection and Mr. Hopwood has been uh, on our case about this for quite a while. So he would be happy that this has now been operationalized um, and set up the witness protection unit, which will in part address the institutional arrangements of the whistleblower protection legislation. Um, in addition, we have also noted that there it's important that the media plays its role in terms of providing information to members of the public for accountability and transparency in government activities and contributes greatly to combat corruption. Lastly, using our domestic legal framework and the UNCAC as basis for international cooperation, we were able to cooperate with at least 13 states across the world to gather evidence and bring charges against the accused persons whose trial has now already started. The cooperation has culminated in successful investiga investigations, which has enabled the trial of, of the case to commend. Our central authority has worked with other central authorities across the globe to ensure that all evidence was obtained in the manner needed for us to use it in our courts. Formal and informal cooperation with these states based on the UNCAC has proven invaluable for Namibia. The provisions of the convention allowing for formal and informal cooperation to its fullest extent provides Namibia with an enabling framework that breaks down the barriers of national borders, differing legal systems, bureaucracy and secrecy. If it was not for the use of the UNCAC framework, Namibia Namibia would not have been able to conduct and conclude the compassing and very technical investigations in this case. Madam Moderator, let me conclude by reaffirming Namibia's commitment to implement effective measures to detect, prevent, and combat corruption and money laundering, as well as strengthening our domestic measures. We call upon states' parties to redouble and sustain their efforts in the fight against corruption for the benefit of the present and future generations. I thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Minister, for a uh, very, very rich contribution, which I wish I could refer to a bit more. But in the interest of time, I would like to call upon the last speaker who is going uh, to be a pre-recorded statement from Angola. Uh, we have uh, the statement from the Secretary of State for Climate Change and Sustainable Development of Angola, Madam Paula Francisca Coelho. So please, for the recording. Thank you, Mr. Ferner, and thank you for the many member states and civil society organizations that have contributed to make this special event on crimes that affect environment access. I'm sorry it could not be there in person, but I'm currently at UAE attending COP28, where Angola is highlighting the links between climate change, wildlife, and wildlife crime, among other important topics. Dear colleagues, honorable delegates, I'm honored to represent the government of Angola at this high level event, addressing the critical nexus between corruption and environmental crime. Corruption poses a significant threat to our ability to address crimes affecting the environment. Not only does it exacerbate the degradation, but it also tackles issues that need to be addressed pertaining to human rights, weakens institutions, and erodes public trust. A growing number of resolutions acknowledge the need of prevent and combat corruption as an enabler of environmental crimes, including UNCAC Resolution 8-12, entitled Preventing and Combating Corruption as it relates to crime and have an impact on the environment. The UNITOC Resolution 11-3 on preventing and combating transnational organized crime that affects the environment. And CITES resolution facilitates activities conducting violation of the convention. At this most end, we recently recognized that in UNGA resolution adopted in August this year to tackle illicit trafficking in wildlife. While acknowledging the broad spectrum of crimes that affect the environment, we would like to particularly emphasize the urgency of addressing wildlife trafficking, wildlife products at every step to the global supply chain. It is one of the most critical factors in enabling wildlife trafficking. Addressing corruption that fuels the illegal wildlife trade requires a multifaceted approach, including governments, law enforcement, and international cooperation. To facilitate international cooperation, Angola strongly believes that the new international instrument to prevent and combat wildlife trafficking should be adopted. However, I would not get into further details today, as I was encouraged to focus on UNCAC rather than UN talk. But as many of you know, 
our president, Honorable Excellency John Lorenzo, has publicly called for additional protocol and a UN talk specifically targeting the issues of wildlife trafficking. This remains a key priority for the government of Angola, which was discussed in more details at the COP Angolan Pavilion this week. Strengthening legal frameworks, however, is only part of the solution to reduce opportunities for corruption, particularly in relation to wildlife exploitation. The government of Angola is committed to implement transparent system and mechanism to hold all relevant actors accountable, including customs, law enforcement official, and CITES authority. Transnational communications coordination and cooperation is also essential. In conclusion, honorable delegates, the government of Angola strongly reaffirms its unwavering commitment to combat corruption, particularly within the environmental sector and particularly as it relates to the wildlife crime. Addressing corruption linking to the wildlife crime is pivotal for our shared commitment to the biodiversity, conservation, sustainable development, and crime mitigation efforts. I look forward for your continuation work with all you on this issue. I thank you. I, I virtually um, convey our appreciation as well to Madam Secretary uh, of State for Climate Change and Sustainable uh, Development from Angola. And with that, uh, it's, uh, we are almost spot on time. If you allow me 30 seconds of concluding remarks, and I know there are many other panels. But first of all, I'd like to thank very, very sincerely our panel. And we will conclude in one minute with a proper applause, of course. But I think it's been incredibly inspiring. And each of you have brought so much to the table. We now need to get out there and do it and, and do more of this and work more together. I think one of the, the, the two key messages, I mean, there are many, of course, that are critical, is the interconnectedness of the many nature crimes, but also nature crime with financial crime. The interconnectedness between formal and informal government, civil society, the dialogue that's really required. And we need to go, and I really like what you said, uh, Madam Minister, you need to lead from the front, I think this is how you said it. And I think with this panel, we've had uh, leadership from the front, and I hope you continue to do that same leadership in this incredibly essential uh, topic every day in your jobs. And I do know that you are all very, very truly committed. So on behalf of all of us, on behalf of our children, our nature, uh, and our societies around the world, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for being here and for inspiring us all. Thank you so much.